Hi, I'm Robin Leach, and you know I've had the time of my life making television programs around the world. Every place I go, I see video camcorders. You know, even the rich and famous have them these days. And guess what? They don't know how to use them either. But you don't have to be a professional to make dazzling, exciting video. Camcorder class will teach you everything you need to know. From the basic shots to the secret techniques of the pros, this videotape course by Emmy Award-winning professionals will start you on your way to a lot of fun and maybe even a few champagne wishes and caviar dreams. And don't forget to send in for your diploma when you finish the course. Sports Outdoor fun Special occasions Treasured moments Vacation memories Your life is full of pictures if you have an eye to see them and a video camera to capture them Welcome to camcorder class. If you're wondering who the guy in the funny hat is, I'm Bob McKenzie. I make a living as a news anchor and commentator for a television station in San Francisco. Before that, I was national television critic for TV Guide. I've reviewed television for a lot of newspapers and magazines, and I've produced a lot of local series and documentaries. The man behind the camera, Don McQuaig, is a professional news cameraman with a lot of Emmys to his credit, and a lot of other awards as well. In camcorder class, we're going to teach you everything we know about making good video. And this is a video camcorder, also known as a video camera. There are many systems, but everything we teach you in this class will apply to all the formats. What they all have in common is that they're easy to use and fun. Video is a hobby you can grow in, and the more you know about it, the more fun you have. When you finish this brief course, you'll have learned the basics of video cinematography as well as some of the advanced tricks of the trade. And if we do our job right, you'll have learned the most important thing of all, how to see through a camera. Before we learn how to see through a camera, let's talk about the differences between the way our eyes work and the way a camera works. For instance, if we look at a near object and then at a far object, our eyes automatically refocus. A camera doesn't. Through a camera, it can look like this. When we look at an object here, then quickly turn our heads to see another object there, we see first one, then the other. Our eyes and our brain cooperate to wipe out the transition in between. When you do that with a camera, it can look like this. It's called a swish pan, and we sometimes use it for an effect. But if we used it all the time, it's a sure way to give viewers a headache. When we walk and look around us, we bounce a little as we walk but our minds adjust the information so that we see what seems to be a steady view. Take the same walk with a camera and you're liable to see something like this. A camera, like an eye, is a light gathering device. A room that looks like this to your eyes may look like this to a camera. That's because an eye is a better light gathering device than a camera. So to see with a camera sometimes means finding more light or making more. When we look at a scene, our peripheral vision takes in everything outside that scene. But a camera has no peripheral vision. Everything a camera sees takes place inside a frame. Anything outside that frame doesn't exist for the camera or for our viewers. The frame is like an artist's easel. What we choose to put inside the frame is what makes us photographers and filmmakers, not just picture takers. People who make good video are people who learn to see the way a camera sees. Before we do that, though, we have to find out how a camera operates. Let's take a look at some typical video cam features. The viewfinder is our window. We look through it to set a focus, determine our exposure, and compose our picture. What we see through the viewfinder is what our audience will see, and nothing else. Every camera has a lens, and every lens has an iris. An iris is a device that opens and closes, like the iris in your eye. The iris admits light. The wider it's open, the more light it lets into the camera. The way we set the iris determines our exposure. 
Some cameras come with an automatic iris that sets its own exposure with no help from you. But there will be times when you'll want to use the manual iris. Experiment with it and see how your picture changes. Many camcorders have a zoom lens. Zoom is such a wonderful invention and so much fun to play with that most beginners overuse it. The zoom brings a picture closer or takes it farther away. We say it widens or narrows the angle. To focus your zoom for any distance, first zoom all the way in, then turn the focus ring till you have a clear picture. Once you've done that, your picture will stay in focus as you pull back. Some cameras have an automatic focus feature. Again, there will be times when you'll want to focus manually. More on that later. Before shooting anything, adjust for color temperature using the white balance control. Focus on something white and move the white balance until you have a true white. Then your other colors will be true. If you forget to do this, you may get a picture that's dominated by red, blue, or green. Whenever you move from sunlight to artificial light, or vice versa, or whenever you move from outdoors to indoors or in to out, you must adjust the white balance again. Your shots are your vocabulary. The more shots you know, the more you can say in pictures. Let's learn the basic shots and proceed to some fancy ones. Most of the time, we'll begin with a wide shot, often called an establishing shot because it establishes our location. A medium shot introduces our characters and tells us what the action is. Medium shots advance our story. A close-up or tight shot reveals character, emotions, personality. A close-up focuses our attention and tells us what's important. A close-up of an object gives that object importance. So we use a close-up only when we want something to be significant. By varying our shots, wides, mediums, close-ups, we give variety to our video and keep renewing a viewer's interest. Steady, stable shots give a video a professional look. Whenever possible, the pros use a tripod. Adjust the height of your tripod to give you a comfortable eye level. Frame up your shot, then shoot. When using a handheld camera, use anything handy to steady yourself for a good shot. A handy fence post can be a made-to-order tripod. Even a convenient rock will do the job. Use anything handy to stabilize yourself. Lean against something solid. Even sitting on the ground you can get a steady shot, resting your elbows against your knees. If you see a shot you want to grab in a hurry with no time to set your tripod, simply rest it on the ground and use it as a unipod. Sometimes wild creatures won't wait for you to set up your shot. Changing the angle of a shot can change mood, even change personality. Shooting a person from above can make that person appear smaller, more dependent, more endearing even. Now changing the angle of the shot can change the personality that that person conveys. For instance, when you shoot the same person from below, that person appears more commanding, more important, more overpowering even. Shooting from a high vantage point can sometimes reveal a scene from a fresh viewpoint. This is called a high angle shot. Look for opportunities to vary your angles. A shot of a runner descending a hill, shot in a standard way, becomes a standard shot. By moving to a low angle, we get a new perspective. The shot takes on drama. The angle emphasizes the height of the terrain. Shooting from ground level can bring us closer to nature and add impact to our framing. Seen from below, our bicyclers dominate the scene. When shooting children, it's often a good idea to shoot at their eye level. This takes us inside a child's world. 
establishes an intimacy with them. We can get a child's point of view by seeing what he sees from his eye level. In fact, whenever we show someone looking at something, we may then want to show what he sees from his point of view. In this case, we may even want to get the crawdad's point of view. When you get your new video camera, the first thing you're going to want to do is go out and start making movies. Well, go ahead. That's what it's for, to have fun with. But think about this, too. Every time you put one picture after another, you're beginning to tell a story. That story will either make some sense and have a beginning, middle, and an end, or it'll be a story that just wanders. So usually it's a good idea to take a minute to think before you press that button. A story doesn't have to be complicated. Something as simple as a family excursion to the playground can be a storytelling opportunity. Jeff is new to video, but already he's learned how to build a sequence. He starts with a wide shot to establish the location and introduce the action. By varying medium shots to advance the action, and close-ups to reveal characters and emphasize details, he builds a sequence that keeps us interested. Wide shots, mediums, close-ups. Those are our basic vocabulary. Now let's look at some more advanced shots. Most of the time when we watch a good video, we're not even aware that the camera is there. That's because the frame stays still while things move within it. So most of the time, our rule is move the camera between shots, not during shots. But there are times when we break the rule. Let's talk about zooms, pans, and tilts. A zoom out can be a dramatic way to reveal a scene and a good transition between scenes. A zoom in can be a strong way of focusing our attention on something. But beware of pointless zooms in and out. Zoom is a powerful effect and you should have a reason for it. Panning from one object to another may be fun for the camera person, but it can be pretty tiring for the viewer. It's almost always better to shoot one object, then move the camera and shoot the other. A slow pan can be an effective way to reveal a landscape. And it often makes sense to pan with a moving subject. Frame up your subject and move the camera as the subject moves. So most of the time we'll pan only to keep a moving subject in the frame. A tilt shot moves the camera vertically. Tilting up a tree can emphasize the height of the tree, the grandeur of it. And while we're at it, by adjusting the viewfinder and slowly turning the upper body, we can get a dramatic low angle pan of the surrounding trees. Rules are made to be broken after all. In a tracking shot, the camera moves with the subject. By keeping the knees slightly flexed and imagining we're moving the camera along a horizontal line, we can keep a fairly steady shot while moving. A tracking shot puts us inside the action, makes us part of the movement. Professional cameramen use dollies, essentially tripods on wheels. But almost anything with wheels can double as a dolly, a wheelchair, or even a slowly moving car. An occasional tracking shot can add a touch of professional polish to a video. When using a handheld camera, it's usually best to stick to wide and medium shots. A telephoto shot going tight on a subject from a distance is pretty hard to hold steady. When you can, simply move closer to your subject, frame up again, widen the angle, and you'll get the same shot with much less bounce and wobble. While we're on the subject, when shooting outdoors, most of the time you'll want to keep the light behind the camera pointing toward your subject. When that isn't possible, you may want to fill in the shadows on your subject's face using a reflector to bounce the sunlight where you want it. A professional reflector like this can be expensive, 
but you can get the same effect with a piece of cardboard covered with foil. Long about this time, you must be thinking, wait a minute, do I really have to know all this stuff? I just bought that camera to take pictures of family occasions. Well, the answer is no, you don't have to know all that stuff, and you can enjoy your camera just by pressing the button and pointing it toward your kids. But you'll find you're not in the hobby very long before you're going to want to take better movies. Movies you can show not only to your family, but to your friends and your relatives and your business associates. Do you have to know it all at once? No, of course you don't. And the best approach is probably to watch this tape a number of times, each time picking up four or five points that you want to remember. Then take your camera, go out and do some shooting, and apply those four or five points. You'll find pretty soon you're taking movies you're proud of. Video is a hobby that you can grow in, and the more you know, the more fun you get out of it. Now let's talk about being ready to shoot. To a professional photographer, the world is a visual place and he thinks in terms of pictures. That's why a pro always has his camera with him, ready to shoot at all times. How many times have you been driving someplace and seen something kind of marvelous that you later wish you had pictures of? Well, that doesn't have to happen to you. You know, you have to keep your video cam someplace. Why not keep it here in the trunk of your car? Some people even build special cases in there to hold their cameras as well as lenses, tapes, extra equipment, that sort of thing. I'm in the news business and more than once we have bought videotape from an amateur who just happened to be on the scene when something unusual was happening. As you get used to seeing what a camera sees, you'll start thinking about composition. Watching the work of a good cinematographer, you'll notice that every frame would make a good still picture. Centering your subject in the frame often makes for a dull snapshot effect. Try placing your subject at one-third of the frame for an eye-pleasing composition. Placing the fisherman at center frame results in a run-of-the-mill shot, but notice what happens when we put our fisherman at one side of the frame. The picture pleases our eye and puts the fisherman in context. Look for human scale. This shot of a dam tells us nothing about its size or its dimensions. Putting a person in the picture dramatizes the size of the structure and it adds human interest. Now let's put some of these principles to work in a typical sequence, like a visit to a railroad museum. You can create a frame within a frame using foreground objects. A tree, a branch, a few blades of grass. Any foreground object can be used to change the configurations of the frame and add visual interest. Here a man-made structure creates a made-to-order frame and a pleasing composition. Shooting from below can give an oncoming train an even more impressive visual aspect. Again, notice how we build a sequence with our basic shots. Wide shots, medium shots, tight shots. Once more, a tracking shot, this time from another moving railroad car, puts us into the action. Looking for imaginative ways to build a story can be hard work, but a lot of fun too, and it can result in a video you'll be proud to show. By the way, here's a shot you may want to try to avoid, posing a person against an object like a tree or a pole so that it seems to be growing out of their heads. Now a word of warning about the automatic iris. Most of the time it will give you a correct exposure, but the auto iris can be fooled. If your subject is in front of a strongly lit background, the auto iris will shut down and give the subject a dark reading. Best strategy here is simply to give your subject a darker background and use the light that's falling in the right direction. In general, don't try to mix natural light with artificial light. It's safer to stick with one or the other. Similarly, shooting outdoors, try to place your subject all in sunlight or all in shade. That way you'll avoid dealing with pesky shadows. You may already know that you should never, ever point your lens directly into the sun. If you do that, you might permanently burn the tubes and that can be very expensive to repair. What you may not have thought of, however, is that the same thing applies to any reflections of the sun. Be careful when shooting reflective surfaces like lakes. If you want to shoot indoors, and you will, you'll have to think about lighting. Now for most casual indoor shooting, a small light like this that mounts on the camera may be all you'll need. 
But for pictures that look a little better, you'll want to invest in some kind of lighting kit. You won't need a professional setup like this, though still photographers often use three or more lights on a subject. If you use it well, most of the time one light will do the job. Pointing the light directly at the subject will sometimes give too harsh an effect. You can soften the lighting by bouncing the light off the ceiling or a nearby wall. As your camera work gets more advanced, there are some accessories you may want to buy. Special lens filters, for instance. That's a fog filter. This is a star filter. A fog filter can add a fantasy effect, a dreamlike quality, to an occasion like a fancy dress party. A star filter splits bright lights into sparkling stars and adds a touch of glamour to a nighttime scene. Well, it's time to talk about sound. The important thing with sound is to get the sound you want and to not get the sound you don't want. There are several kinds of microphones you may be using. This little gem is called a lavalier mic. It's the way you're getting my sound right now. It's a good kind of mic to use when one person is speaking. It leaves your hands free in case you need them. Microphones are unidirectional or omnidirectional. A shotgun mic is unidirectional, gathering sound only from where it's pointed. Most hand mics are omnidirectional, gathering sound from a wide angle. And how long have you lived here in San Rafael? Using a hand so mic is here, the most convenient way to conduct an interview. But if you want a more natural look, you may not want the mic to appear on camera. You can enlist a friend as a sound technician. Just be sure you keep her and her mic out of the frame. You'll want to keep the camera on your interview subject, shooting at an angle over the shoulder of the interviewer. Almost all camcorders come with a small microphone mounted on the front of the camera. Working in close quarters, most of the time that mic will be all you'll need. When shooting a conversation between two people, you can put your interview subject in the center of the frame. A more interesting shot, though, is to have your subject looking across frame at the other person. You can see how the opposite way of doing it, though, gives you a rather awkward picture. Now let's look at the work of an experienced home video maker. Neil has had his camcorder several years, and he knows a few tricks. He knows, for instance, that panning back and forth between the players in a tennis game is a sure way to induce nausea. So he sets up his camera toward one end of the court with the angle on one player. Then he'll move to another location toward the other end and frame up the other player. But he keeps his camera locations on one side of the court. Neil has shot sports before, and he knows about the line of direction. You should, too. Think of an imaginary line running down the middle of the tennis court or the playing field. A good camera person stays on one side of the imaginary line, moving to different locations, but never crossing over. If he did cross over the line to shoot the game, his line of direction would be reversed, and both players would appear to be on the same side of the court. Or one player would be receiving his own balls. Like any alert camera person, Neil looks for ways to vary his shots. A ladder is a handy tool for grabbing a high angle shot. It's a good idea to hold a shot for three full seconds. One, two, three. But Neil knows that if all his shots were the same duration, a viewer would get bored. Faster cutting can add a sense of excitement, action. Neil puts an assistant to work for an improvised dolly shot. He could move in on his subject simply by zooming in, but a tracking shot gives a different effect. He wants a dolly effect this time because he wants to follow a moving object. Neil's story will be about a horseshoe game. The game will be real, but Neil plans to do a little staging along the way. Neil knows he wants his scene to shift to a new location, so he lets his subject walk out of the frame and walk into frame at the new location. A good camera operator avoids jump cuts. This is a jump cut, a subject in one position in one shot and in a new position in the next shot. Let's look at it again. To avoid jump cuts, Neil changes subjects as he changes shots. He also changes his angles, alternating wider shots and tighter shots. Once again, a foreground object makes for interesting framing. A good idea as long as the tosser's aim is good and Neil doesn't get a horseshoe right through his lens. If your subjects are willing to do a bit of acting, you can set up a piece of action that's done purely for the camera. Neil is patient 
and builds his story a shot at a time. Look! See that? I told you I could beat you. All right, I'll buy you lunch. All right. Sometimes you may want to shift your scene from one location to another location at a different time. But if you change scenes without warning, the viewers may be confused. They don't know we're in a new place at a new time. So let's learn some transition shots. One useful transition shot is our old friend, the swish pan. When you start shooting a scene, frame up your final shot, pan quickly to one side, and stop shooting during the pan. Arriving at the new location, swish pan in the same direction, starting your shot as you move, and stop on your subject. The finished transition looks like this. Another good scene changer employs the focus ring. Focus out at one location, change locations, and focus in on your new scene. Use the manual iris for another transition. Fade out at one location, fade in at the other. Another interesting way to start a fresh scene is called a rack focus. Focus on a foreground object, then change focus to reveal your subject in the new location. It takes practice, but practice pays off. Now let's have a few cautionary words. Many modern camcorders can record two hours or more on one tape. That can be a great advantage, but it can also be a temptation to overshoot. In the old days of home movie film cameras, the shooter was often limited to five minutes. There were a lot of boring home movies made, but at least they weren't long and boring. Choose your shots judiciously. Pick the highlights. Be brief, be punchy, make a little gem. Sooner or later, everyone who owns a camcorder is asked to shoot a wedding. Some have even made a lucrative sideline career of this, and a few camera owners have even gone into the business of shooting weddings. But whether you shoot one wedding or a hundred, there are some guidelines to how to shoot them that'll make that wedding footage fun to look at. Here's what you need to know. One of the first things you'll want to do is look over the location of the wedding sometime before the wedding happens. If you can, attend a wedding rehearsal. But if you can't do that, try to look the location over at the same time of day the wedding will take place. That'll tell you what your lighting is going to be like, as well as give you a chance to look over where you're going to be standing for the shots you need. On the day of the wedding, shoot your audience before the ceremony begins. You won't want to be panning away during the ceremony to get pictures of the audience. You'll already have checked with the bride and groom to find out who the special people are, so you won't leave out someone important. Be sure you're using a fresh battery and have a spare with you. A wedding only happens once. Once the ceremony begins, you'll want to catch everything important that happens, but don't overshoot. You want the highlights, the telling moments, not a blow-by-blow -blow account. Most of the time, our view of a wedding is from behind the bride and groom, a pretty dull view. If the church will allow it, try to position your camera behind and to one side of the minister so you can see the faces of the bride and groom. If you're recording sound using a camera-mounted mic, you'll have to get close. A better bet is to arrive before the ceremony and set up a microphone near the place where the couple will stand. Again, you'll want the memorable moments, not necessarily every word of the ceremony. Once the wedding begins, you probably won't be able to move around freely. If you have a friend with a camera, ask your friend to cover some of the other angles. Once the final words are said, there's usually enough delay for you to set up outside and to shoot the happy couple as they make their exit. As always, try to position yourself and plan the shot so you won't be shooting into the sun. In shooting a wedding reception, as in shooting any party, the less you stage manage it, the better. Still, photographers tend to say, now everyone bunch up, smile, that sort of thing. That works sometimes for still photos and doesn't work for video. Let the party happen as it really happens. Go for candid shots of people looking at each other, not at the camera. Don't announce when you're shooting and when you're not. Be a little sneaky. Of course, you'll look for your basic shots, wides, mediums, and close-ups. Watch out for backlighting and avoid those random pans around the room. Remember, this is a tape for people to watch, so go for the best moments, the ones you'll want to remember. You don't have to shoot hours of tape just because you have hours of tape. You're a storyteller, not a record keeper. 
Shoot a wedding tape that's meant to be watched, and it'll be watched for years to come. You're marrying that old man, though. You guys can't A modern camcorder will go any place you can go. If you're a skin diver, you may want to invest in one of these. This is an underwater housing. You can buy them or rent them, and they make different models for different cameras. If you're capable of diving to 50 feet, well, so is this. Don McQuaig shot this underwater footage using an inexpensive camcorder and the underwater housing you just saw. Shooting underwater, it's better not to use the autofocus. They're not reliable underwater. Set your manual focus for five to 10 feet. Instead of zooming to bring a subject closer, simply move the camera closer. Unless you have underwater lights, you'll want to stay in shallow water. The red end of the spectrum starts to disappear as you go deeper, and below 30 feet, your picture will be all blue. But in most tropical areas, you can see most anything you want to see in 10 to 20 feet of water. There's not much point in chasing fish with a camera. They can move faster than you can. A good maneuver is simply to drift with the current like a log or a piece of kelp. The fish will take you for granted as part of the landscape. Another good trick is to notice an area where fish tend to congregate. Move slowly to that location and find a stable position. The fish will swim away for a while, but just relax and wait. They'll be back. Your camcorder can be as much a part of your life as you want it to be. It's good for more things than just shooting family occasions. Just with a pencil and a piece of paper, I jotted down about a dozen ideas. Interview your parents or your grandparents for future generations. Set aside one tape for annual stand-up pictures of your kids with a measuring tape in the background so you can watch them grow. Class plays, graduations, and birthdays, of course. But how about the everyday things like your present car, your home, and your neighborhood? You'll be surprised how much they'll change over the years. How about your job and what you do there? Send a video letter, either a personal letter or a business letter, instead of sending one on paper. Then you can show the things you want to talk about. Keep a video diary, record your hobbies, your favorite sport. If you have an important meeting, why not put it on video so you'll be sure what everybody said? If you deal in a business where you have merchandise for sale, why not put out a video catalog of your work? The only limits to video, really, are the limits of your imagination. By keeping your mind open to the possibilities, you can find new ways to see the world through a camera's eyes. Rod Wentler couldn't ride his miniature train, but his camcorder could. By strapping the camera to the train, Rod produced a wonderful sequence. Maybe some people are born with a talent for making pictures, but most cameramen develop what's called a cameraman's eye through experience and practice. Alfred Hitchcock used to carry a wire frame in the shape of a motion picture screen. He'd use that to compose his pictures. Most cameramen, though, carry that frame in their heads. Once you learn to see the way a camera sees, you can't help making good video. Good luck and have fun. <laughs>